can't complain. I'm enjoying the weather. Yeah, yeah, we got uh, some nice uh, beginning of fall days, end of the summer heat here. So um, Pastor Mapis is over there. I'm Pastor Climola right here. We're um, at uh, Toledo. We're in Toledo, Ohio. I'm at Trinity Lutheran in Toledo, Ohio. Where are you at? I'm at my home right now, actually, ah. in the house. So, yeah. <laughs> so. I thought you might be in Castalia, but you're the pastor of yeah, Concordia Lutheran Church on yeah. South Detroit, right? Yep, it's uh, it's it's much quieter here if I do it at the house. I have a preschool, toddler room, and all that good stuff. It gets quite loud there during the day, so uh, I record from home when I can. Yeah, so well, we're starting something new today, and so we're um, hopefully are uh, tuning in to to see what we have to say and uh, in it for the long haul. We we're, we're not going to waste your time by uh, spending too much time talking about what we're going to talk about. What we're going to talk about is this book right here. It's a uh, Summary of Christian Doctrine. This is going to be a series that we're doing um, 56 sessions if we uh, stick to it and get through it. Um, we're going to go through this book um, chapter by chapter. And, and this is just, uh, we've been using this. Uh, we've, we've had a series before. You can find it on YouTube or Facebook. It's what does the Bible say about? And as we've done those, we've found this has been one of our primary sources. And so we were talking about uh, what we're going to do to keep uh, this, this content useful, hopefully content hopefully useful content out there for you guys. So we thought, let's just walk through this book and and uh, see what it has to say. Cause you know, I haven't read it cover to cover, um, but hopefully within the next year or so, I will have read it cover to cover just by uh, sheer force of will for the sake of this. But it really outlines teachings of the church. And that's what that word doctrine means is, is teaching. Um, so we're gonna go through key teachings of the Christian faith. And um, so, yeah. It's, uh, it's also by necessity we have to go this route because we're going to be two congregations divided by electionary. Yeah. So we have to have a plan B here coming up. Uh, so, hey, so be it. Yeah. Our, our What Does the Bible Say series started out as kind of like a topical thing. And then it uh, once we um, exhausted some hot topics, we started falling into a lectionary reaction. You know, what does the Bible say about based on the, the teachings? But uh, come Advent, you're going to stay with the one-year lectionary. We're going back to the three-year lectionary here at Trinity, and and so we're um we're looking to stay on the same page. And this is a great way to do it. This uh this book um, again, I'll just hold it up here for you. The Summary of Christian Doctrines by Edward Kaler, and uh, written originally in 1935. Kaler was born in 1875. I found out today, so a year after Trinity was founded. So coming up on his 150th birthday. Uh, but this book is uh um. It's it's a great uh, what I just read it to you before we jumped on here so I can find it real quick. A, a summary of Christian doctrine is a plain and simple statement of the doctrines of the Bible, avoiding technical terms and discussions. It, it also appeals to the average layperson. So this is um, it, it just strikes me. This is just such a beautifully written book. It's easy to understand. You don't have to uh, pull out other books to look up definitions. You know, it does drop some latin every once in a while but it it, it 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 explains it in parentheses right away so you're not like well i should know that but i don't and um yeah well, dr. So dr keeler was a uh, I believe a professor at concordia river forest uh the teacher's college uh, i think he was a professor from 1901 to 1935 i believe and that's the year he wrote this book i'm going to fact check you on that 1909 to 1951 1909, 1951. Okay, wow. That's on a long tenure. Longer than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> this is the back cover. <laughs> I was close. Anyway, I can't speak from memory, but yeah, it's a long tenure. Um, and, and he and I again he wrote this, as you well said, that it was for pastors and laity to teach the faith. Yep. So yeah, we're so, gonna we're gonna do that and that's that's what we're going to do so let's start doing it the uh the first section here is um about the holy scriptures um so this book is broken up into how many parts are there all together uh, nine parts no 11 xi in roman numerals means 11 so how's that for approachable text um so there's 11 parts in this book and the, the first part or section of this book is about um the holy scripture and and so the first part of this section is about the Bible, and we're just going to jump into what that has to say. It's each each section or each part of each section, however we want to delineate it. Each each one of these series uh, 
episodes that we're going to do, we're just going to follow the outline for the, the chapter that's there, um, discuss what it says, and draw some conclusions, implications, and um, see what comes of it. So, no, it's and, and Kaler starts out, uh, he, he starts out with the most important thing. Uh, the, the very thing that where we where do we get all our doctrines from and and, and so what is the source and norm of all christian doctrine it, it co- it's the bible itself right so that's why we're starting with the, the holy scriptures and, and he kind of gets into some biblical proofs on why it is the scriptures uh, to begin with because uh, he can, and he starts right off it's interesting he says no one can tell us what god wants us to believe and to do but god himself right that's a very emphatic statement and so, okay, if it's only God himself that tells us what we are to believe and what to do, where do we get that from? And the logical conclusion, that is the Bible uh, with that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and immediately my brain goes, and I don't know if, if your brain is as distracted as mine. I think I know you well enough to know it's close to, if not the same. But, well, well how do we get the Bible? That's going to be another uh, session coming up in a, in a couple uh, episodes here, a couple weeks. But the... Uh, um, but yeah, so the, you, you mentioned the source and the norm, and I, I spent a little bit of time just saying, you know, source and norm, what does that mean? So source um, literally means like, you know, where where uh, the source of a river is, where does a river begin? You know, where does the water flow from? Right. And um, and so so when it comes to Christian teaching or Christian doctrine, our source of Christian teaching is the Bible. And the norm, the norm being the the standard by which you judge something, so you measure it to see if it's staying in line with it, is the Bible. So, so for us, it's it's the Bible. The Bible is the source of everything. It's the the standard, the measurement, the the thing we line things up against to make sure they're in agreement with the Bible. So it, it's obviously there, uh, perhaps seemingly obvious for for some, but that's it's such a foundational reality. The rest of this um, series will flow from that topic. The the Christian faith flows from this. This truth, this ideal that that the word of God is um, as in the Bible is for us the the place that we go for all things. But but yeah, I love that. And it, and he, uh, what you said about um, no one can tell us what God wants us to believe and and do except for God Himself. And then the First uh, Corinthians two verse eleven passage says, "No one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God." And, and so for for us to know the things of God. God has to reveal himself to us and, and he's chosen to do that through his word. And, and, um, and, and we want to live in that word. That's why studying of his word is, is so important and, and, and making that, um, that case for, for comparing and everything we, we think and believe our, our actions, our lives to the word of God. Well, it gets to when you talked about the source and norm, uh, there's a Latin phrase in the dogmatic world. It says the norma normans which is the ruling rule. Mm-hmm. And that is what the Bible is for us. And then you have the norma normata, which is, is, is like our confessions, that it, it's ruled by the rule, uh, the Bible. Yeah. But it always comes down to the Bible. That is the ruling rule on everything that we judge. And Keeler makes a great comment here. The word of God must also be the norm and criteria according to which teachings and teachers are to be judged. Mm-hmm. Guess what? That means you and I are to be judged by the sheep. The people yeah. we serve, they are used the Holy Scriptures to judge what we believe, teach, confess, or when we're preaching and what we're saying in the Bible studies, is that correct exposition of the Word of God. Yeah. And they are used the Bible for that, is that rule to measure us. And by standard, we also measure the people by that same rule. Yeah, how, how, do, you like that to, how do you like that to look in your uh, ministry? How do you like to be judged? So, so say you preach a sermon, uh, what, what day is it? Yeah. Thursday. This coming weekend, and and um, and and you misspeak or you have a misunderstanding on something. How would you, as a pastor, like to be corrected by a church member? I would love for some. I mean, I've had this a couple of times already, especially in the Bible study. Someone would either text me or call me or say something next Sunday. Hey, Pastor, you said such and such. Are you sure that that's how it's supposed to be? There's been a couple of times I've been corrected. There's been a couple of times I've had, uh, you know, I've corrected them, but that's the conversations you want to have. Right. Because, because you and I as pastors love to love to hear our, our people that we're called to serve actually pay attention to what we're saying and, and catching us when we're misspeaking. Right. 
I mean, that means we're doing our job, <laughs> you know, the word right. of God is working and doing what he's supposed to, you know, doing his will through the, the, the mix of the midst of the people there. So that's just a wonderful thing when it happens. Yeah. And, and thank you for, for answering that and for bringing that up and pointing out that quote there, because I, I think this is something people probably need to hear and hopefully are, are happy to hear that your pastor makes mistakes. I mean, not that we <laughs> are happy to make mistakes, but there are times when we, we get things wrong or when, you know, you got so many things going on in your head, you take a, a quick reading or you haven't studied it deep enough. Um, and I'll be so bold as to say, I, I usually get everything right. Um, but sometimes I'm not saying things clear enough. And so I, I don't know that I'm not speaking clearly enough unless somebody says, I think you said this, is that true? And, and it gives me the opportunity to say it better next time or, or to, to clear up any misconceptions. Or like you mentioned, there's times when I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> I was saying that wrong. One of my favorites was uh, I was teaching a new member instruction class. And we had this really smart guy who's still a member here of the church. I won't name him, but um, if he's watching this, he'll know who he is. Because I was talking about the, uh, the Lutheran view of um, communion. And I said, you know, we believe in consubstantiation. Because I was just going on root definitions of words, you know, this is the substances that are um, at the same time con, uh, they're, they're there. And so it's the both substances, bread and wine, body and blood. And so I said consubstantiation. He came up to me afterwards. He said, you know, you should really be careful saying consubstantiation because that's a historically loaded term that's been uh, that the Lutheran uh, confessions actually deny and, and are against that because in that. I, I can't even get you all the details now, but I, I was corrected and I was like embarrassed. I was like, I cannot believe I stood up in front of a new member class. And, and so we we use the term just to wrap that up real quick. Real presence is the terminology we use to talk about Christ truly present in the, the bread and wine as he promises through his word. But but yeah, there are times when we're just like, oops, that's more reading I should have done. Well, even everything, even our, our Luther confessions, and all our dogmatic statements. So we have a uh, we have a statement there that Dr. Kaler uh, puts in, it, in our Lutheran Confessions with the summary of the Form of Concord, which is the last section of the mm -hmm. Book of Concord. And he states, we believe, teach, and confess that the sole rule and standard according to which all dogmas together with all teachers should be estimated and judged are the prophetic and apostolic scriptures of the Old and New Testaments alone. Now, it's interesting the Confessions doesn't say the Confessions are the authority. No, the right. confession state, the Bible is the authority. Yeah. That we rule, that we judge and measure everything by uh, with that. Right. Yeah. And and the way the way God gives us the scripture is, um, and this is, I think, where it starts to get difficult, you know, because you know, sometimes we like to play armchair quarterback. Okay, we always like to play armchair quarterback and second guess. Um, not only God, but other people. And, and that's where the term comes from. You're watching the football game and you're like, I would have done it differently. And, um, but, but we, we, you know, in, in our world, it would make sense if God would just give us everything we need to know directly, but that's not how God chose to do it. God chose to give us this uh, word through words, through human language. So he, he uses the, the knowledge, the intellect that he has given us to, to lay hold, to receive these uh, these truths that he gives us in his word. So so the use of human language and, and all of the intellectual gifts of language associated with language use, speaking, reading, um, communicating, um, grammar, um, e even logic, those are all things that God uses to give us his word, right? Of course, and, and it's it's you know every Sunday we either confess the the Nicene or the Apostles Creed, and that first article is I believe in God the Father Almighty Maker of heaven and earth. You know we understand what those words mean and that God has given us all our reason, our senses. Uh, these are gifts from God, and we are to use those things in the service of God. And so the question is, well, how does God reveal His will to us? As you rightly spoke, is is that through human language? Yeah. And you look throughout the history of the Christian church, of course, we had the Bible, the Old Testament started out with the Hebrew language, and then what we understand is street Greek, the common man's Greek, and then over the next thing you know, it was translated into Latin, the next thing you know, it's in the Gothic language, the Germanic languages, and now we have it in English, now we have all different kinds of translations, uh, you know, in English. But all these things, God reveals his will to us through that human language, and we are to exercise our intellect into studying the in the scriptures. And we had, you know, in the churches throughout 2000 years, 
as they study this, we've understand it. We, we look at everything through the analogy of faith. Mm -hmm. That is those clear statements that come up from the pages of the Bible, which represent the fundamental doctrines that we are to believe. You have fundamental doctrines, you have some non-fundamental doctrines, you have some open questions that through some parts of the Bible we're never going to understand right. until we're in heaven. Yep. You know, we just weren't there. It was meant to be written for that time. We just don't know. But those fundamental doctrines that come up, they're very clearly spelled out, as Luther would say. Even a child can recognize the simple, simple clear statements that come up from the Bible that tell us about our salvation in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been conveyed to us through, through human language. Yeah, so so this this use of language is is the instrument, and that's that's one of the highlighted words that that shows up here in Kaler. Um, this instrumental use of our intellect is it's proper and necessary if we're to know the scriptures. And so, um, and, and I and I I love the idea of that uh, our our intellect is instrumental, or or um, to to riff on that word, it's a tool. Um, it it serves the the word, and and that's. That's one of the things that I, I like to point out in early on in confirmation class and, and constantly point people back to when we're studying God's word is that our, our brain and intellect, our reason, our understanding is all in service of God's word rather than the other way around. Sometimes we, we think that, okay, well, this has to make sense to me. Otherwise, it's not going to be true. And, and that's not the way it works. It's kind of what you're saying. There, there, there are some things that aren't made clear to us from scripture. Doesn't mean they're not true. It just means they're not given for us right. to be able to explain. And, and we, as Christians, if you hold the word of God to be the, the norm and the source, that, that's one of the, the key fundamental realities of, of our Christian faith. And in Lutheran tradition, I think does a very good job of this, letting things be in tension, letting paradoxes stand when the paradoxes are, are presented in scripture, where it seems that two things are true at the same time and they seem to be contradictory, but we, we don't have the full picture as God does. He's only given us a glimpse. And so so this um, the, the dichotomy that I, I like to use is, uh, the magisterial or the ministerial use of reason. And so we don't use our, when it comes to uh, the things of faith, we don't use our reason as a magisterial tool, as if um, God's word is going to submit to our brains and, and make, make yeah. our brains satisfy. Rather, the other way around, our brains are going to serve God's word. And, and in service of God's word, we're going to take what God has given us and use it for the sake of the world around us. No, that's, uh, and just to clarify too, like in those open questions, as you search the scriptures, as you, you know, if, as you get more familiar with English and as pastors, we, you know, we learn Greek and Hebrew and all that stuff. We learn the grammar and the syntax and all that fun stuff. Even you can go from the milk of the word to the meat of the word, even with some of those things with those non fundamental or those open questions, you might, you read something in the scripture today and not understand it, but through that continued study, Five years down the road, something's gonna click. Ah, now I get it. Right. You know. Yep. So it, it's 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 designed. The scripture is designed for us to dive in. Yeah. And search the scriptures. I mean, look for Christ. Look for salvation. Those things are clear written, but also dive in those lesser things. Uh, it's all for our our, our own spiritual growth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. And for, further down in this series, we'll get into the the purpose of the Bible. Talk more about that and and why it's okay that we don't get everything clearly explained to us. But one last thing on that um, idea of using their, our intellect and everything, um, there's an il illustration I like to use in, in teaching confirmation class to help see this is that, um, and, and it's a picture of driving down, down the road in a car. So I, I as a, a parent, will have uh, sometimes five kids in the car with me now that I got a couple drivers in my children, uh, uh, what do you call it? wheelhouse they're they're a little more informed but you know when when kids are riding in the back of the car you're not going to listen to them and, and take directions from them unless they say they have to go to the bathroom you're, you're you know <laughs> they really have to go you're probably not gonna uh, pull over just because they want you to but but they're in the car and they're important to you and they're part of your life and and i like using that illustration because god's word is in the driver's seat of our life we we let god's word drive our life um, but in the back seat, we have our intellect, we have our emotions, we have our, um, uh, what, what's the other one, the, uh, the three ladders, the uh, intellect, emotions, and uh, rationalism. Um, Rational, yeah. 
Racialization. Um, uh... I, I just forgot the third leg of the, the stool that, uh, uh, oh gosh, I just talked myself into a corner here. <laughs> I'm trying, I wish I could bail you out, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. So anyways, you got things in the back seat that you're not going yeah. to, 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 to let drive the bus. And so you're not going to let your emotions uh, take the wheel. And you're going to let God God's word drive your, your life. You're not going to let your intellect or your rationalization say, well, that just doesn't make sense to me. You're going to submit to God's word and let him lead you where you're supposed to go. And, and I think that's that's such a powerful picture of that. And it'll come back to me probably uh, when I'm falling asleep tonight. But there's there's a third one that we we don't let the uh, let in the driver's seat of the car that kind of just summarizes. Basically, the bottom line is nothing but God's word is in control of our life. Those things are good to have around. And they're good to appreciate and to understand and to utilize God's word. But you submit even those things, your your rationale, you, you submit your emotions, you submit them to the word of God. Well, I know Keeler talks about, uh, you know, getting on that point four about the, using uh, the right and wrong use of human reason and determining truths. That's kind of where we're at now, talking about those things um, and the gifts that we, you know, that we are given uh, to use as tools to interpret the Holy Scriptures. One thing Dr. Kaler really points out that's forbidden that we as Lutheran Christians uh, should really watch out against, that's what they call a, a judicial or a critical use of human reason. That is because it, it goes to your magisterial use. Yeah, what right. The word magisterial of, of, you know, lording over the text with those, uh, with your reason. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, or maybe even uh, sometimes you'll even see where, um, where, where things of science, of modern day science will seem contradictory to what is clearly revealed in the scriptures. And that, you know, we're, we're, what point now do we, we try to compromise between the two or do we do something else? No, we always stick with the Holy Scriptures. God right. was there when he created everything. I mean, just using creation as an example. Uh, we're talking about the Lord's Supper, you know, uh, the, the Holy Trinity, all those things, uh, philosophers and, and uh, whether science or anything, of this world will try to figure out or try to formulate somehow using those judicial or critical use of human reason over and above the scriptures uh we have to let the scriptures be that final authority right well it, god's going to be the final authority whether we want him or not right. we want him to that's, or not <laughs> so that's just what it's going to be we'll find really, out we'll find that out when he returns i mean it's, so it's really nice that he actually gives us a clue as to what that authority looks like and and how to yes. be a part of it so our scriptures that he gives us you know give us a hint um and more than a hint to to know what that that looks like no i i love the second right. corinthians 10 verse 4 to 5 passage that's here for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, that is having to do with the flesh, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And so every thought into captivity of the obedience of Christ, so the word of God is, is the thing that, that holds everything. And like you said, we'll, we'll be judged according to the word of God. And we have it given to us to, to enjoy now. By the way, the third one I looked it up while you were talking uh, is moralism. So moralism, rationalism, moralism, okay. and and, um, gotcha. um, and emotionalism, or, or there's another word for emotionalism, but yeah, right. So no, so, it's yeah. uh, what you want to kind of move on. We've talked about. Um, I think we beat down the human reason enough. I think we all understand that the, the right. word of God is the final authority. Or thing. Now the biggest question. I think now is okay. We have the text; it's the final authority. How do we interpret the Bible? Yeah. So yeah, I'm going to throw well, it down I, your court. <laughs> I was surprised, and he, he he sets out a three. Is it threefold here? A threefold uh, um, explanation, or or to find the the sense of a text, or what the text means, and, and so he says. Uh, um, so so finding the uh, the let's see, uh, the, finding the, the statements of scripture, taking the words as they read, and, and then ruling out whatever conflicts with uh, the rest of scripture. And, and that, that third right. part is the one that I, I go to, ruling out whatever conflicts with the rest of scripture. Um, so basically, the way I, I take this and have always thought about it is let scripture interpret scripture. And, and so that's, that's where we find interpretations of the Bible. So we don't um, we don't approach the scriptures and say, 
you know what, this, this lines up with what I learned in Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Um, we, we don't approach the text and say, you know, this, this lines up and, and I believe yeah. this because it, it applies to um, the law of thermodynamics. You know, we, we don't take other outside sources and say, well, this makes sense because I, I saw this happen and one time and, and no, it's scripture is the source. And so uh, interpreting the Bible correctly means letting the Bible interpret the Bible. This isn't, this is what I've always heard and what always been said. And, and that's a hard, hard thing to, to live in and realize as a, a member of the Christian tradition, Christian faith, because we have centuries, decades, millennia of, of people that we draw on their wisdom from, but ideally they're drawing from the word of God. But, but when uh, something is um, human originated, can't be found as starting in scripture, it doesn't become a, a teaching of the church or a teaching of the Christian faith. Am I, am I laying that out right? I think so. Yeah, I, I believe so. Because it gets down to, uh, I mean, to scripture interpreting scripture is a great reformation principle. And you see a lot of the church fathers too, and mm -hmm. would uh, held to that principle. And, but the underlining all of that is you take this, the, take the scriptures in their plain literal sense. Yeah. Unless you're given a reason not to, depending on the genre, if you got a prophetic text, okay, there's going to be some symbolism but when you take your basic narratives of the bible you take it in its plain literal sense as real written history yeah and and, and that's the first and foremost what we always do you take it in its plain literal sense uh with that because you have to start there and especially when you're talking about the analogy of faith or those clear statements from other bible passages and especially when it comes to doctrines yeah uh, we take the plain literal sense when it comes to the words of institution that was Jesus' last will and testament, those words. We don't take them as figurative or something prophetic or no, it's, it's his last will and testament. We take them as a writ. Right. Unless we're told not to or giving some reason not to for the text. But yeah. we don't let our reason have that judicial or that critical use uh, to, to uh, overthrow the plain literal sense. No, I, I like if that. That you makes said sense. You know, that makes a lot more sense than the uh, finding, setting forth, and reaffirming the divinely intended meaning of the statements of the scripture. So, yeah, finding what this literally means, you know, Moses crossed the Red Sea, you know, that's what it means, and, and that's that's what it is. Um, and then yeah. um, a second point is, is making sure to understand the words in their uh, proper context so that, yeah, as you mentioned, there's apocalyptic literature, which gets a lot of attention and creates a lot of heresies um, because yeah. it's confusing when you take it in its literal sense without understanding the context or the form of the, the writing that's there. But then, yeah, three, uh, we we look at the rest of scripture to make sure it's in line with these, these words that we have been given by God. Yeah, and to all the massive crowds that be watching, the audience that be watching this program. Hey. Yeah. Uh, make sure you, uh, your pastors, when they're preaching, that they're giving the plain literal sense of what that text means, how it was intended to be heard for them before they can go forward and actually apply it to us 2,000 years later. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, and that's, that's part of what we have to do as, as preachers, is to just give that plain literal sense of the text. How was the people then? I mean, how did God intend to, the people 2,000 years ago say we're preaching on the Gospels? How, what, how did God intend for them to hear that before they can start making applications and, you know, and doing all kinds of other stuff for text first? Uh, that, that's a job for us. And when yep. you're reading your Bibles, sitting there in your, in your chair reading your Bibles, you start with the plain literal sense. Yep. If it doesn't make sense, put it on the shelf. Pray about it. God will, you know, and as you continue on, Studying the scriptures, a lot of times those answers will, will be given to you from scripture interpreting scripture. Amen. No, that's good stuff there. So, so the, uh, the next section here in this, this part is uh, human sources of doctrine are rejected. And I think we, when we talked earlier this morning, we, we were both a little bit wrestling with this uh, um, rejection of human sources of doctrine. This doesn't mean that well, my pastor told me, so I'm rejecting it because he was the human source. So that that um, I think is one of the ways you could interpret that. But if if there is no biblical source, no biblical origin for a teaching in the church, 
then it's going to be rejected. Um, and the uh, human uh, origin of any teaching or or doctrine of the faith, it's it's got to be it's got to be from the Bible. Well, the, I give you an example of this: the medieval church, as we were talking about this earlier and wrestling with this. You know, the medieval church and during the time of the Reformation, you know, priests weren't allowed to marry. But we know from the text of Holy Scripture, there's no, there's nothing in particularly the New Testament that says that the apostles or pastors uh, called church workers, they weren't allowed to marry. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in the text that says that. But yet the church during the medieval times and time of the Reformation forbid marriage to the priest. There's an example. Another example is sometimes medieval church, uh, and it's still carried on today uh, in large sections of Christianity. You know, you're not you're you're supposed to eat fish on Friday. There's nowhere in the Bible that says thou shall not eat fish on Friday. Yeah. I mean, so there, those are again where you see human authority now is uh, with doctrines being imposed upon God's people that has no basis in the Holy Scriptures. Right. And and yeah. and and uh, no, that's that's well said. But it, one of the dangers is uh, throwing throwing things away just because they aren't from Scripture. So how do how do we as Christians do things? Such as we have a, a traditional liturgy in our our church, and so yeah. the Bible never says yeah. you have to use an organ. Um, so we shouldn't be using right. organs, right? What where's that at? What where do we go? Well, what, that comes under the the understanding of adiaphora. That is a Latin term that means that things are neither commanded nor forbidden in the Bible. But we also, but we also use the analogy of faith. We use our theology, the analogy of faith, faith, and with that starting point of all the things we pull up from from the Bible, we now have a practice that follows with that. That's theology and practice. Mm -hmm. So why do we always use an organ? Well, it's, for the most part, it's one of the most reverent instruments. Our services are forever. We believe that God is truly present with us in a Sunday morning service, right at the beginning of the invocation, uh, with the preaching and reading of his word, when his body and blood's on every altar, okay? God is present with us. Mm -hmm. So we use things and we practice things and we use liturgies that came right out of the synagogue. Yeah, there, what's, what's, you know, there is a, there's a lot of man-made element to those liturgies. Um. But they were designed to as vehicles to bring good order to the church, to present God's word in a reverent and clear way yeah. uh, through repetition, memorization, and presentation. And, and so that would be my answer to that. Um, so whenever we try to introduce new practices into the church, we must always ask that question. Will it convey God's word the way he intends it to be conveyed? Yeah, yeah. And if we and, truly believe that he is present, how are we to react if we truly believe he is present among us? If his yeah, presence for, is real. For sure. Yeah. No, and yeah, there might be some argument around whether or not the organ is the most reverent. Yeah, I, you know, I just but, threw it out there, right? But I mean, that, that is the is common too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it, so the instruments aren't aren't defined in scripture. And you, you could you could even hear I have heard people make the case, well, gu guitars or lutes or you know. Uh, those types of instruments, stringed right. instruments are mentioned in the Bible. And it's all good, but but I think that is the good framing question is what best conveys the word of God. And the liturgy is such a beautiful thing because most of it, if not all of it, is the word of God. Like you said, straight out of the synagogue formatting and the, the things that they were doing in the, the, the temple worship and, and the words come from scripture. So it's such a beautiful thing to know that that we're there for the sake of the word of God to do its work for us in worship. But we'll talk more about worship when we get to that, that yeah, session. Right. Um, um, it's interesting, uh, going into, uh, you know, these human doctrines, going into a section, why are, why man-made doctrines are not to be accepted. And Dr. Kaler gives four points here. And, the, and he, they're very simple, really. Uh, and he, he starts out by to accept man-made man doctrines as the doctrines of God First point he makes, he just comes out, it's foolish. Okay. It's just foolish. He says, and I'm using the old King James version of, of the uh, Kaler's uh, a book, but it says, in vain do they worship me, te teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. That's mm -hmm. from Matthew 15, 9. Um, it, it's foolish. That's right off the bat. The second one he says, 
uh, doctors, uh, doctors, a man will not establish give and give firm assurance to the heart. And this is really a critical one. This is something that we as Lutherans have always, uh, and even going back to our confessions, um, you can see that clearly there in our in the Lutheran Confessions, the Book of Concord, because one of the things that came out of the Reformation was as Christians uh, out of the medieval church, they didn't have that assurance of their salvation. Yeah. And it's because of man-made doctrines yeah, that right. robbed them of that assurance. So we as Lutherans have always been guarded about that, especially looking at, at the potentially a false doctrine. You know, the old saying goes, legalism will kill your faith very quickly, but false doctrine can will kill it very slowly. It kind of creeps up on you, and eventually it robs your assurance of your salvation away. Um, he talks at... Uh, he gives a good passage here from Hebrews 3, 9. He says, do not, do not be carried away with different and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. Because mm -hmm. when you look at the scriptures, you look at our salvation, it's by the grace of God and the person and work of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's where we find our assurance. Yeah. Yep. I'll let you deal with the last two. Yeah, so the last two uh, reasons uh, that man-made doctrines should not be accepted as the doctrines of God. It's dangerous because it destroys the right faith. Um, so uh, Jesus cautions, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Um, so that, that would be an extreme. I, I don't think every doctrine of man-made man doctrine is necessarily setting out to destroy people, but that's when it takes you away from the assurances that you have in God's word, um, it could ultimately lead to that, that kind of destruction. So we want to be on guard against it. And then um, this is this last one. I, I love, like you said, these are so simple. It's simple. It's it's foolish. Number one, it, it doesn't give assurance to the heart. Number three, as we said, it's it's dangerous because it destroys the right faith. And number four, it's it's sinful because God forbids it. <laughs> that's that's yeah, could you get more simple than yeah. that? Um, and and uh, Jeremiah's book. This is just one passage from Jeremiah that speaks to this. But Jeremiah twenty three thirty one quoted here. Uh, God says, behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who use their tongues and say, he says, um, and, and so he talks about the lying prophets who put words into God's mouth. And um, that's, that's something, like I said, shows up a number of times in Jeremiah's book that um, Jeremiah was preaching against these false prophets. And, and it's, it's dangerous. You, you can see why um, someone purporting to speak for God um, is it, the, one of the worst atrocities you could you can imagine because they're they're tr literally trying to lead godly people away from the truth that we have as lutherans also our our doctrines our theology if you want to say everything we believe teach and confess as lutherans we always we always i'm going to say err on the side of the objective reality yeah that it's clearly spoken in the analogy of faith that the clear word the clear bible passages that come up from scripture now there's a subject subjective reality to our faith that what the, you know the the emotions that well up in our heart uh, as you hear a good hymn or a sermon strikes you in a certain way that's the holy spirit working through you but we don't rely upon those subjective things we're always grounded in the object if it's you like think look at our worship service we're always in the object reality right it's like the kids in the back of the car you, you, they're there they're good you, you like them yeah. Um, they're part of your life, but they don't drive the car. Uh, the Word of God does. The Word of God does, yes. Yeah. Um, you want to kind of get back, or well, kind of Dr. Keir closes us out the, with the position of the Lutheran Church. And he, he quotes some uh, passages from the Book of Concord. Remember, the Book of Concord is not the, is not the Norma, Norma Normans of the Lutheran Church. It's the Norma Normata. It's, it's ruled by the rule that yeah. is by the Bible. But it is our boundaries and how we what we believe, teach, and confess, and how we function as a church. And so, Dr. Kaler uh, quotes a few of those uh, doctrinal statements that we believe mm -hmm. from the Book of Concord. And he begins there with the uh, with the he quotes from the summary of the Formula of Concord. And he says, "Our Luther confessions are very explicit on this point." He says, "We receive and embrace with our whole heart the prophetic and apostolic scriptures of the Old and New Testament as the pure." clear fountain of israel mm -hmm. that is the church which is the only true standard by which which teachers and doctrines are to be judged very clearly emphatically right. the lutherans 
I mean, that was something right off the bat. This is probably around 15, in the 1570s, a statement was made. Yes. Uh, this is sometime after the Reformation, but they, they understood it was the Holy Scriptures with that. Yeah. No, the, um, uh, I, so, so he goes, goes on and uh, the, um, from the uh, small called articles, um, he says that, um, quotes Luther where it says, it will not do to frame articles of faith from the works or words of the Holy Fathers. The true rule is this, God's word shall establish articles of faith and no one else, not even an angel can do so. And, and I, I just love that you, you got church fathers and angels put into the same, not as important as God's word category. And, and so, yes, does our church, do we, in the, even in these videos today, quote or, or reference the church fathers? Yes, we do when they support the word of God and, and angels, they were God's messengers numerous times throughout the Bible. And um, we, we can't say that God won't use angels as messengers these days, but we don't take an angel at its word and say, well, an angel told me we take an angel's word and we say, well, where is this in line with scripture? And, and to go back to scripture real quick. Well, when Mary got a message from Gabriel that she's going to have a baby um, and he will be a savior from sins, she had all sorts of Old Testament stuff she could point to and be like, Whoa, this is happening. And uh, so so we we go back to God's word and and compare these things to God's word, and God's word's the ultimate there. Well, even in the context here, this is Luther, he's addressing the issue of the mass, yeah, which was full of man-made doctrines at the time. Uh, but he he bases this off of Galatians 1:8, you know, where Paul says to the Galatians, if we, of that being the apostles, or angels from heaven preach to you a gospel that's contrary to the one that you received. Let them be an anathema. Let them be accursed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's built off the, even the even the text of scripture itself. It says, it, "I'm the authority." Right. With that. Yeah. Oh. Um, going on to the next one there, the apology. I think Article Twelve that has to do with the uh, repentance, I believe, on the Article of Repentance. Uh, it says, "We concede neither to the Pope nor to the Church the power to make decrees against the consensus of the prophets." That is the Holy Scriptures. And, and so, again, as, as people of God, we always need to watch. Uh, not only are we are to guard each other, right, and judge each other against with the rule of Holy Scripture. We are to um, judge our Senate by the rule of Holy Scripture. Right. If they would be in convention, vote on something, and pass something that's contrary to the clear word of Scriptures, we need to call that out right? as the people of God. Yep. Whether it's the church or popes or presidents or whatever that might be. Yep. Yeah. And the uh, the last the last point he makes here, uh, confessions maintain we are certainly duty bound not to interpret and explain these words in a different way. For these are the words of eternal, true and almighty son of God, our Lord and creator, redeemer, Jesus Christ. We cannot interpret them as allegorical, figurative turns of phrases in a way that seems agreeable to our reason. Remember. What's in the driver's seat? It's God's word. With simple yeah. faith and due obedience, we receive the words as they read in their proper and plain sense. We do not allow ourselves to be diverted from Christ express from Christ's express words by any objections or human contradictions spun from human reason, however appealing they may appear to reason. And and that's just huge. My my brain just goes to all the current events and topics, top top topics right. of our day that we could talk about. Where where we have words being redefined, um, institutions being redefined, just because it seems more loving and caring and accepting. And um, God's word gets the last word, whether we realize it or not. And my hope and prayer is that I continue to realize where God's word is in my life and, and everybody who stumbles across it, puts it in its proper place and, and lets, lets it lead and guide them through the, the life that God's given us here. You know, that's well said. I can't add any more to that. It, uh, it, it's very sobering when you kind of read through these and we're talking out loud, of, you know, yeah. um, how central the scripture the scriptures are to us and, and to our church. Uh, it's yep. a good reminder for all of us. Absolutely. So so there you go. That's the Christian teaching on the Bible. And we'll be back uh, with uh, the next segment in the future. Yes. Hey, it was good. It was fun to start something new. Mm -hmm.